Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the Virtual Island Summit. My name is Francesco Sindico. I am the co-director of the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. And it is my great pleasure to moderate today's session, a very exciting session, a session that will focus very much on the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, on public participation, on island communities, and on some very exciting developments in many countries and many islands, and also at the global level in the UN family. Now, as all the times uh, that we have seen this session, it's always nice to know who we are. And I know James is, uh, or maybe has already, started the first poll. And the first poll is really to understand where do we come from, or maybe where do we consider home, which is always a difficult question to ask. But I will give a few, a few seconds, I will answer myself, and everybody can submit it. And that will give us a geographical spread of the participants, just to get a bit of a flavor of who is uh, in the audience. And I, I'm really liking these kind of things because all of us who have been to conferences, we don't know that. We sit next to people, but we don't really know where they come from. So I think this is actually one of the features of the Virtual Island Summit, which makes the Virtual Island Summit very innovative. And here we are. So we have a nice mix, a nice spread. Let's see, Europe comes up first, but just for a little bit, the Caribbean has been very powerful in this Virtual Island Summit. And uh, um, we can see other areas of the world. Now, the other poll, again, just to get a flavor and also for the participants and the speakers is uh, what is it that we do? So what sector do we come from? So can I kindly ask those in the audience to tell us which of the different sectors that you have in front of us represent you? And if you submit it, we'll give it a few seconds. And again, we can ha have an idea of the audience that we have in front of us today. Um, I've seen in previous virtual sessions that we really have a nice spread, a nice mix from academia, public sector, private sector, NGOs, and so forth. And I'm expecting nothing less for this, uh, uh, for this session. And as you can see, I was right. We have a really interesting mix of academia, private sector, public sector, NGOs, uh, nobody from the utility company, but I'm sure we know some of them and we can just tell them about it later and tell them what incredible session they missed. Now, I asked James to come up with a third poll. I hope you don't mind. One of the key issues today is about the sustainable development goals. And I just wanna get a rough feeling whether your work relates in one way or another with the Sustainable Development Goals. And the SDGs is exactly the Sustainable Development Goals. And you're more than welcome in the chat to explain to the rest of your uh, fellow audience what is it that you do in relation to the SDGs. I'm going to answer myself. And that will give us an idea of how many in the audience uh, obviously know the SDGs, but also work on SDG-related matters. And I'm quite curious to see what, what will come out of that. And as expected, I can see that most, if not all of us, feel that they work and do stuff with SDGs. And um, I think I can already see in the chat numbers popping up, which tell us which SDGs everybody's working. I think that's really, really exciting. Now, before I give the floor to our speakers, let me just tell you, a little bit about uh, our center and what we do and how we bring this to life. Now, the, the Center for Environmental Law and Governance is interested in better understanding how island communities engage in legal and political processes that promote resilience and sustainability. So really what we're interested in is in public participation, consultation practices, bottom-up policies, which is very much what we're gonna hear about today. And we're gonna hear about these experiences from Croatia, from Hawaii, from the Island Islands in Finland, from Scotland, and also from other small island developing states. But before we begin, I hope you, do, I hope you allow me to share something that is very important for us here at the center, and may I say for all of us who work and live in Scotland. 
So the center has had the privilege of providing technical advice to the Scottish Government Islands team in the preparation of the first Scotland's National Islands Plan. And I'm happy to say that this is literally, I don't know whether you can see it, hopefully you can, this is literally off the press. This has been laid before Scottish Parliament last Thursday. It has been presented to the Parliament on uh, yesterday by the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse. And it is a requirement that is present in the Island Scotland Act 2018. This is a place-based piece of legislation aimed at providing islands and island communities with a stronger voice. And this should resonate to many island communities, not just in Scotland, but around the world. And Scotland, and I'm delighted to say also Croatia, is one of the few countries around the world that has a place-based piece of legislation like that. The National Islands Plan is one of the provisions. The other one is called the Island Communities Impact Assessment that provide this stronger voice. I will not talk more about it because I know that our speaker Nicola, Nicola Crook, will say more about it, but I couldn't not start with uh, sharing with all the audience the fact that Scotland has a national islands plan, or better to say, a proposed national islands plan that will now be in front of Parliament for 40 days. Now, I will begin by introducing our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Tajana, Tajana Huzak. Tajana is Assistant Minister of uh, the Directorate for Islands from the Government of Croatia. And I will give her the floor now. And I would just like to thank Tajana again for joining us. I know she has to leave before the end. So if you do have any questions directly focused and specifically for Tajana, please use the Q&A button at the bottom and Tajana hopefully will be able to answer any of your questions that you may have. May I also remind everybody that if you are in the chat, you will need to click on all panelists and attendees so that everybody can follow the chat. And if you have a question, please do not put it on the chat, but put it on the Q&A so it will be easier for us speakers to look at it and for me to moderate it. So I give you the floor I give you the floor, Tajana. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, hello to everybody. I'm so glad and I'm so pleased to be a uh, part of this uh, team, part of this uh, communication uh, uh, on behalf of Croatia, on behalf of Ministry of Regional Development and EU funds, and especially or precisely uh, Directorate, Directorate for Ireland. So uh, let me uh, allow to introduce you with a brief and review of Croatian regional development or SDG uh, development or, develop, uh, or policy uh, and development policy of Croatian islands. So just in few words, uh, Croatia has uh, 1,244 uh, islands, uh, 78 uh, big islands and uh, inhabited of that are 48 of them. So uh, it means that uh, on this island uh, lives uh, 132,000 people and they are uh, organized at uh, seven uh, coastal island counties and uh, 59, 59 local governments on islands are situated and uh, took uh, about uh, these uh, items. Uh, 18 cities and uh, 41 municipalities. Uh, a strong island national development policy has as its main objective the sustainable development of Croatian islands, which is also defined by the new Island Act, which came into force at the end of December of last year. The fundamental purpose of sustainable island development is the continuous and sustainable use of the island's entire potential in economic, technologies, social, and any other sense in order to protect the invaluable natural resources of our islands respons responsibly using their potential to a degree that does not endanger the preserved and sensitive island environment. And on the other hand, ensure a stable economic growth and quality life on the islands that will stimulate demographic development. 
by achieving such a balance and by setting sustainable development as an imperative at the local, regional and national level, we ensure long-term prosperity for the Croatian islands. Croatia uh, considers the cohesion policy a key investment instrument of the uh, European, uh, United, European uh, directed towards providing a balanced development of Croatian islands. The cohesion policy is an important instrument that enables economic growth and sustainable development, and it is considered as a vital source of public investments. It provides to be a key component in reducing disparities among various regions to date. The cohesion policy should further contribute to achieving strategic goals of the EU while taking into consideration national and regional, regional differences with the view of promoting structural and administrative reforms. In the period after 2020, cohesion policy will largely be orientated towards the sustainable development of the islands and particularly towards the concept of smart islands. Cohesion policy of creation islands consists of determining priorities of island investments according to development characteristics of the islands, implementation of new and modern me mechanism of island development policy, customized public intervention towards specific development needs of the islands, targeting territorial integrated, pro integrated projects, and stronger involvement and linking of local and regional stakeholders in island development policy. Croatia respects the new European legislation for the islands and has thus consulted Article 174 of the Treaty on European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, where permanent natural and geographical difficulties are identified characteristics for the situation on the islands, then European Parliament resolution of 4 February 2016 on the special situation of the islands and also Smart Islands Declaration from March 2017. The introduction of the European Smart Island Development template is in line with the resolution of the European Parliament on the special situation of the islands and then declaration of the uh, Smart Islands. Well, that's the, uh, the point that uh, creation are um, sign this declaration also. A smart island is a component of the overall spatial economic development policy as it can and should be used as a template for planning and promoting the development of sustainable technologies that are once tested and implemented in islands. Conditions can be introduced to the land, land more extensively. Once of the defined development directions of the national development strategy by the year 2030 is Croatia's advanced regions. And one of the re recognized strategic goals of territorial development is the goal of stimulating policy and investment to enable regions to achieve full comp competitive potential and balance in development. Within this, the development of smart and sustainable islands has also been included as a new concept of island development in the European Union. Within the smart and sustainable islands, key areas of intervention are defined as well, smart management and smart resource management, smart economy, smart mobility, smart environment and smart living and safe islands. Potential areas of investment aimed at the development of smart and sustainable islands in the Republic of Croatia are based on the principles of the island special situation and the smart island declaration, which related to the adoption and mitigation of climate change and the strengthening of res resistance against in the local level. Mm, through uh, construction of, uh, sorry, Well, I would like uh, to say just a few words 
about regional development and European uh, Union funds. So the Ministry of Regional Development and European funds in cooperation with the European Investment Bank will support the islands through the development of an investment platform for smart and sustainable islands, which will be a catalyst for public and private investment and will serve as a pipeline of projects with thematic and geographical focus. Advisory support aims at identifying smart island projects, identifying the appropriate financial structure and supporting the establishment of an investment platform for smart islands as the first such investment platform in the European, European Union. The inventory of projects to be identified through the investment platform for smart and sustainable islands will be the basis for programming key areas of intervention for the development of smart and sustainable islands in the new, in the new financial perspective of the European Union 2021 to 2027. Tazana, I'm extremely sorry. Can I kindly ask you whether we can draw the conclusions? Because I need to also give the floor to the other speakers. Okay, Thank you following much. the provisions of the Island Act and the National Development Strategy and further work on strategic planning documentation of island development, which includes the development of the National Island Development Plan and develop, development plans for each island and island group, as you mentioned before, and then in their implementation, the imperative is certainly the implementation of the system of renewable energy sources and the highest possi possible energy efficiency and innovative technology. By doing so, it will contribute to preserving the natural resources of our islands, use their lowest risk natural geographic potential, reduce their dependence on main mainland and make them sustainable to the fullest extent possible. With its approach and action in this direction, we also support the European Union's policy and we consider the transition to clean energy as in, uh, in, in an inevitable. So thank you for attending. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Tajana, thank you very, very much. Uh, Croatia is a really interesting um, uh, policy for islands, and I commend you and your government for bringing this policy forward, and I look forward to the implementation of it, as you said. So thank without you further ado, for these words. you're welcome, and there will be questions. If people have questions for Tajana, please put them in the Q&A and hopefully Tajan and her team can react to the QA and uh, that way you can also uh, interact with her. Yes, okay. I will kindly ask uh, Tajana to mute herself okay. and uh, I will now move on to our following speaker, which is uh, Chiara Kelaoja. Chiara is Global Fellow and Outreach Associate with the Hawaii Green Growth United Nations Local 2030 Islands Hub. Uh, Chiara will tell us about the hub a bit later on, and she will now uh, tell us more about her, her home country, Hawaii. Uh, I had the amazing opportunity to visit Hawaii last year, and I was absolutely impressed by the policies related to sustainability and the amazing work that Hawaii Green Growth is doing. So the floor is yours, Chiara. Thank you, Francesco. So let me just share my screen really quickly. And I just want to say hello to everybody. Aloha mai kako. I'm really grateful to be here today with all of these inspiring panelists and all of these really um, exciting um, participants um, and to have the opportunity to tell you about the story of Hawaii Green Growth. So I'm here today representing the Hawaii Green Growth United Nations Local 2030 Hub, which develops local solutions to global sustainability challenges, building on island culture and values and indigenous knowledge. With the Global Island Partnership, this hub highlights islands as laboratories for innovation that catalyze and scale integrated ridge to reef, or as we say in Hawaii, Mauka to Makai projects, cutting across the energy, food, water, and urban nexus. HGG formed in response to the 2011 Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, or APEC, in Honolulu to identify green growth priorities within an island context. 
In 2014, HGG's public and private leaders announced the Aloha Plus Challenge as Hawaii's local framework to implement the UN Sustainable Development Goals. What is so special about this Aloha Plus Challenge initiative is that it continues to have unprecedented political support to achieve, to achieve time-bound sustainable development goals and indicators. This political coherence is possible in Hawaii because of the systems thinking that is inherently intertwined with our identities and cultural values as island people. So when we as HGG convene statewide public, private, and civic sector partners to drive action on Hawaii's Aloha Plus Challenge and the SDGs, the exact solutions, targets, and metrics may not be immediately clear. However, what brings everyone to the table and what keeps everyone going are their shared island values. Aloha Aina, a love for the land, Malama Honua, to care for island earth, and Hei Nohona Ai Oya, a culture of sustainability. The progress of the Aloha Plus Challenge is measured through an open data impact dashboard that features state and county level data across social, economic, and environmental priorities such as renewable energy, recycling, fresh water security, affordable housing, invasive species, land-based education, and economic diversity. The Aloha Plush dashboard was developed over two years through a convening process involving hundreds of stakeholders, and it was designed for decision makers, practitioners, and the public to measure impact, identify policy gaps, and drive action. On the screen here, you can see examples of the information that is available on the dashboard, including which SDGs each of the Aloha Plus Challenges six focus areas support. And I can include a link um, to the dashboard in the chat um, after I'm finished. The dashboard is not only a means for us to transparently track our progress, but it is also an opportunity for us to actively engage the community. One example would be the Windward Zero Waste TUI, which is a partnership of Windward Oahu schools working cooperatively in the pursuit of waste reduction, soil restoration, and applied environmental education with five participating schools. HGG launched the first community data pilot mechanism with this um, initiative on the windward side of Oahu, capturing and reflecting food waste diversion and composting data on the Aloha Plush dashboard through an interactive mobile app upgrading them from pencil and paper data, logging and illustrating the importance of student work on the actual state government website. In 2019 alone, the Windward Zero Waste Hui diverted over 75,000 pounds of school lunch waste and turned it into compost to sell to surrounding communities. Um, and the sales benefit school garden programs, just to include that in there. So based on Hawaii's leadership and the collective accomplishments by public and private partners, the Aloha Plus Challenge, the Hawaii Green Growth Network was invited last year by the United Nations to become one of the first local 2030 hubs worldwide to support place-based action on the global agenda. The Local 2030 Initiative, which was launched by Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, is an innovative network that brings together the UN system, local actors, and national governments to collaboratively develop and implement solutions that advance the sustainable development goals at the local level. And the HEG Local 2030 Hub, together with the Global Island Partnership and really with all islands, is dedicated to uplifting solutions for islands and all communities on the 2030 agenda. Excitingly, at the UN General Assembly two weeks ago, Hawaii and Island Partners launched the Local 2030 Islands Network at a Global Island Partnership event. And the Local 2030 Islands Network is a new platform to catalyze local Im implementation of sustainable development goals, connecting communities with the global effect to advance the SDGs with the UN Local 2030 Partnership. Founding Local 2030 Island Network partners and supporters include the Republic of Seychelles, Republic of Marshall Islands, Grenada, Belize, Curaçao, Ireland, Hawaii, Guam, Surigao, the UN Development Program, who is being represented here today as well, uh, UN Habitat, the Global Island Partnership, HGG, and UN Foundation. And I will be expanding a bit more about the network later on in this session. Um, but for now, that's it. So thank you. Kiara, thank you very, very much. Uh, I saw one of the comments when you put the Aloha Plus dashboard 
was impressive. And I have to say, I used that word quite often when I was in Hawaii last week, not just for the natural beauty, but also because of the bottom-up policies and the incredible innovation, very cultural, culturally sensitive. And uh, so again, a huge well done, not just to you, but also to all the colleagues at Hawaii Green Growth. So let's move on. And from Hawaii, we move back to Europe and we ask uh, uh, Petra Granholm to talk to us about the Island Islands. Now, Petra, is a research coordinator at the Island Islands Peace Institute in Finland. I had the pleasure and uh, the opportunity to work with Petra on a number of occasions over the past years. Interestingly, we have never met in person, so we are very virtual colleagues and friends. And I think the Virtual Island Summit really resonated with Petra. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that, I could, uh, that we could have you on board for the summit. The floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see and hear me now. Yes, great. Uh, so I'm Petra and uh, I will tell you a little bit about our sustainability process in the Åland Islands. So uh, we are located here in, in the middle of the Baltic Sea, part of Finland. Uh, but Åland is an autonomous territory within Finland, which means that we have our own parliament and our own gov government and can legislate in a number of fields. And we have our autonomy partly because we are a completely Swedish-speaking region in, in a country that is mainly Finnish-speaking. And for over 160 years we have also been demilitarized uh, under international law, which is why Åland is sometimes called, called the Islands of Peace. And I think peace is also central to our sustainability process. I would dare to say that it's at the very core of our sustainability vision. Um, my workplace, the Åland Island Peace Institute, uh, do research into something we call the Åland example. It consists of the three unique feature, features of our islands, our autonomy, our status of demilitarization and neutralization as well and minority rights protection. A hundred years ago, the Åland issue was a dispute between Finland and Sweden, uh, which was solved by the League of Nations. Uh, the actual solution is not what's the most interesting here, but maybe the process of development over the hundred years that has gone by can tell us something. The changing surroundings that a society like Åland had to react and respond to is a form of resilience and it's the essence of the Swedish term Bärkraft, term Bärkraft, which is the name of our network on, on sustainability here on the islands. Uh, and we, in this way, we try to re respond to challenges. And the new challenge we have is, of course, the global sustainability challenge. And the question is now whether we can build on this example and these previous experiences uh, to contribute to the solution also uh, on this one. So it, it started, our sustainability process could, could be said to have started in 2015. We had our, our all on parliament elections uh, and the sustainability issue was partly because of international happenings and partly because of local movements uh, and election campaign issue. After the elections, the new government took the campaign promises seriously and turn to the vivid civil society in the island and ask the questions, basically, how? How should we do this? And the answer somehow came naturally through inviting everyone with a sustainability interest on board on the sustainability journey. And our network, Bärkraft, was born, consisting of representatives from the public, private and civil sector, basically anyone who wanted to join. And my workplace, the Holland Island Peace Institute, joined Bycraft as a co-actor with the firm belief that our sustainability process builds on a strong foundation of peace on the islands. Peace through our autonomy institutions and the militarized status. So things that helped us on from the very beginning was of course uh, the very recent uh, adoption uh, of the UN SDGs by then, uh, four years ago. So we decided to make our own local version of the SDGs through something we call the Holland Development and Sustainability Agenda that has a vision and seven strategic development goals, ranging from trust to clean water and conscious production and consumption patterns. 
we needed the definition of the term sustainable development and this is why we turned to the four sustainability principles that uh, originally was uh, established by the organization the natural step and it should not be underestimated how good it is to have an answer when somebody asks what sustainable development in concrete terms is from this organization the natural step we also got the method of backcasting or the ABCD method, uh, which meant that we started with making awareness about our situation and a vision where we want to be, then making a baseline analysis of our current state, looking at the gap of where we want to be and where we are right now, and then uh, brainstorming uh, concrete ideas, and then to decide on the priorities of these ideas, ABCD. Uh, Despite the fact that we are so small, there is of course not consensus on everything on women and definitely not on sustainability issues either. We are a society of 30,000 individuals and there is a divide between the only town, Mariham, with 11,000 inhabitants and rural areas uh, on the main line and, and then the archipelago. Uh, among these, we have 16 municipalities which is self-disputed, but that's another story for another time. time. So if you ask what an island communi community to us means, you could probably either say that uh, the whole of Oland is an island community, or we have 6,500 different ones, which is how many islands we have. But basically, that would not be possible. And of course, not all of them were inhabited. inhabited only about 80 of them were inhabited. So maybe an example of an island community would be this example of, of Kökar. Uh, it's one of our 16 municipalities. Uh, uh, it has a population of 240 people. It mostly consists of, of sea, not so much land, but it has uh, its own sustainability plan, which other municipalities also have. And this plan involves clean water, uh, clean energy and tourism strategies. Another community example would be the youth. Uh, as you know, our youth around the world right now is very active on sustainability issues. Uh, and also in, in the Nordic countries, all of you probably know Greta, she's from Sweden. So, uh, so but we also have on the island every, every, two, every year, for two years now, we have had the Regeneration 2030 Summit. Uh, and they focus on implementing the, the SDGs in the Baltic Sea area. And you might know that the Baltic Sea has its own sustainability challenges with the eutrophication and a lot of pollution and, and its very specific conditions. So we are right in the, in the middle of this sustainability challenge here. But this, is, this community exa example is, is led and organized by the youth themselves. So, uh, I'm coming to the end, but this is basically uh, the overview of our uh, of our actor. If you ask, sorry, I think I went the wrong way. If you ask which actor is in charge, uh, I would say all of these uh, uh, in this circle, but mostly the story itself that we have created. I was thinking about it when Kiara was speaking about Hawaii. We also have our own very local understanding what of what. The, sustainability means to us and this would be the vision everyone can flourish in a viable society on the islands of peace and this is at the core and it's our guiding light and to guard it we have a development and sustainability council which i myself are part of we have the civil society network of backcraft who is the hub for coordination together with the two sustainability pilots and our lead strategist we have a working group for the status report that is produced annually and central as it's presented at the yearly Bearcraft Summit to everyone uh, and it keeps track of progress towards the goals. We have different sector specific initiatives, we have our autonomous institution where uh, we're involved in Nordic cooperation, youth cooperation and of course cooperation with the Finnish state on sustainability and we have outreach such as this event right now. And now for four years from the start after the adoption of the SDGs and right before the Oland Parliament elections 2015, uh, uh, we now have new elections four years on. 
coming up in just a few days. And now we are a bit nervous because we are wondering whether this initiative would actually last uh, over the elections, uh, a political shift might happen and, and we, will, we will be put to the test. So you can ask me again in half a year whether it seems to be working or not. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, the work that uh, the Island Islands have been doing on sustainability has been just absolutely amazing, the bottom-up nature of it, and the link with the SDGs, I think, is particularly interesting. So I'm sure there are many questions that have already popped or comments in the quiz, uh, sorry, in the chat, and I'm happy for you, Petra, to reply to any of them that you feel appropriate. But I'd like to move on and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nicola Crook. Nicola Crook is a PhD researcher at the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance. As you would imagine, Nicola and I work very closely together and Nicola and I have worked very closely with the Scottish Government Islands team providing, as I said before, technical advice in the consultation and in the preparation of the National Islands Plan and Nicola will tell you more about it. Nicola, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Francesco. Delighted to be here today. Um, I'm just about to share my screen with you so we can start the presentation. Yep. Hopefully that should be us. Okay, hi everybody. Um, as Francesco's already said, it's a very exciting time for us at the moment in Scotland with our Islands Act and just the laying of the National Islands Plan in the last couple of weeks. What I'm going to do, to do today is take you through the consultation process um, and how we undertook this. And basically try and share some good practices that we believe came out of this consultation process. And this comes down to four key questions for us. The first one is who is an island community? The second is, how do we prevent one voice representing an entire island community? How do we keep the engagement with the island community once the consultation event itself has concluded? And how do we collaborate with the island community once the law or the policy informed by the consultation has actually been implemented? Now, before we get on to that, just as everybody else has done, just to give you a brief overview of the Scottish islands themselves, and we have 96 inhabited islands, around 100,000 people at the time of the last census, which is 2011. Um, and this spans through six local authorities, um, only three of which are made up of only islands by themselves. So to move on to the first question, who is an island community? And this itself is quite difficult. It's a very difficult question to answer. The Islands Act gave us an overview of how the National Islands Plan consultation should be undertaken. And you can see that on the screen at section four. We had to consult each local authority as listed in the schedule. Other persons as they consider, consider likely to be affected. Oh, sorry, can everybody still hear me? I'm just getting it, my internet is unstable here. Is that okay? Great, thank you, sorry. However, once talking to the Scottish Government and Minister himself, he wanted us to go wider than this. It should be a wide ranging consultation process to include as many people as possible. And to do this, we had a two pronged approach. We had an online consultation process, which followed the traditional format. But it was a face to face event, so we really tried to make a difference here. And what we did is that we had 61 events between April and July. Um, so that was a three month period. Originally, it was extended to 14 to include some later islands and we covered over 40 islands with this. And these are the islands that we visited during the consultation process. And what we're really trying to do was break the mould of previous consultations by going to ground level, by going to islands and asking everybody, anybody could come to our events and tell us their opinions on the National Islands Plan. And it should be noted here that we could not have done this a lot of the time without the Scottish Island Federation who facilitated it all for us and the likes of local partners such as the Jura Development Trust. The, having the relationship with these partners really made this experience what it was and let us get the data that we got. So to, to conclude with question one, sorry, what we see is that an island community for us is absolutely everybody. Everybody that is on or related to an island had the chance to contribute to this consultation event. The next question is how do we prevent the one voice representing an entire island community? Now, in many instances, what we'd find is that often, for better or worse, um, in these open style events, one person dominates the event. 
um, and they might have completely legitimate um, views that they want to get across, but we wanted to make sure that everybody that attended had the opportunity to have their say. So the format that we undertook was a mixture of it's called World Cafe Methodology and Open Space Technique. And basically, what we aim to do is allow every per participant to share individual views, come to a consensus as a group, and then discuss the more in-depth details together as an entire group. Um, and this is the kind of three stages that we went through, as you can see um, presented here. So we provided a space for participants to share what works well on their island. We then moved to, towards providing an opportunity for participants to voice what the current challenges on their island were. And then we provided a forum to discuss in greater depth some of these challenges and the solutions that the participants themselves came up with. And this is just a very quick picture to show you one of our consultations um, and the process that's involved. What we wanted it to be was very interactive and we didn't want it to be a typical high table and everybody asking questions. To be perfectly honest, we didn't do very much work. Um, it was very much the participants themselves. We just facilitated the event and all the information was taken from them. Now, as you can see here, this is just to give you an overview of the challenges that have been discussed a little bit more detail. So part of the consultation process was asking participants to decide what challenges they'd like to discuss in more detail for the event. And I'm sure it's the same across many of your islands, but just to give you a quick overview of what came out from ours, it was likes of transport, economic development, depopulation and community empowerment that came through very strongly. And it should be noted here as well that the format could be adapted. So in some cases we had 40, 50 participants and others we had eight. The format itself could be adapted to either of these groups. Um, if it was above eight people, we tended to do a, a official consultation event, um, which went through the whole hour and a half process. And if there was eight or less, sorry, less than eight people, it was more casual discussion, but still trying to get the same topics out from it. So the question number three, how do we keep the engagement with island communities once the consultation event has finished? What we found when we came to these island communities was that they were sick of consultations, many of them. And there was a lot of scepticism around them. Does this even make a difference? And we understood that. And what we tried to do was tackle it to make, it, to make them be aware that their input mattered. So we did this in two ways. Um, the first was that immediately after the event, we had templates that captured the data immediately from what the participants had gave us, so nothing was lost. And then what we did was within, hopefully, usually about two or three weeks, we sent the participants out um, a report on that specific event. And then we asked them to give us any comments and feedback on that specific report. These reports were then fantastic to be able to feed into the National Islands Plan. And the whole idea was to make sure that not just were the participants' views captured at the event, but that we had captured them correctly. So they had another chance to correct us if we'd missed anything or hadn't gotten anything exactly as they wanted it. So we called this the feedback loop. It was a feedback loop. We wanted to start with participants so they felt involved in the process and so we could keep getting input from them throughout. And this is just a quick idea of what these looked like. They weren't just one page documents. And um, they're usually five, six, sometimes eight pages, depending how big the event was. And they're, they're a fantastic resource for us going forward. And if anybody's interested, that's a link just below that I can share later. So the final question is, how do we collaborate with island communities going forward? And um, this is just some of the feedback, feedback from participants that we've gathered. Um, I did not think I'd be able to contribute as much as I did. I came to the event with very low expectations. Um, but the main one that we should focus on is it was a great event but how will this really change the situation on my island? And that's a legitimate question that we have to answer. And we were very honest with it. We kept saying that the national plan is not a magic wand. It is not going to change everything the day after it's implemented or in the year after. It's an all outcomes for island communities that have to be improved. And we really see this consultation process as the start of a relationship with island communities that we need to foster going forward. And this is where we come to in terms of next steps. What we have to do is ensure that island communities are included in and informed of progress towards the delivery of the National Islands Plan and its implementation strategy. So what we have at the moment, as Francesco was saying, was a proposed National Islands Plan. This now is 40 days to receive feedback from all the stakeholders and the island communities themselves. And while this is underway, we're also working on the implementation strategy for the plan. And this is where the measurable outcomes 
um, for the different sectors will be developed. And that is where it is essential that we keep this relationship with islands and have them continually involved. It is also essential that island communities must be able to hold the Scottish Government to account um, and challenge them in some way if the plan is not delivering as expected. The plan does have to be re reported on every year and it does have to be reviewed every five, so that is a mechanism that's currently in place. But that is essential going forward um, that the government themselves are able to be held to account. And just to bring in the SDGs, um, these are going to be crucial for the implementation strategy. Um, and the National Island Plan itself does recognise the SDGs, um, particularly as Scotland was one of the first countries to commit to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and they will be used in the implementation process um, to develop meaningful indicators as well as a national performance framework, which is already in place through a lot of Scottish law and policy. And this is just to conclude that this is really what we're aiming for. This is what somebody put up of what would you like um, for your island and somebody put meaningful action from consultations. Um, and this is really what we're trying to deliver through this process and the National Islands Plan and the implementation strategy going forward. So thank you very much for listening. Um, again, it's been fascinating to hear from all the other countries that are further down the line of us and already have ways of measuring, um, which is fantastic. So I'm looking forward to hearing the rest and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. And uh, I just want to highlight the last thing you said. I think the, the measuring part of it uh, is something very crucial and where we probably have good practices both in Hawaii and in the island islands that are worth exploring. I now give the floor to Riyadh, Riyad Medeb. Riyadh is a policy advisor at the United Nations Development Program and uh, I am delighted that he can join us and I give you the floor now Riyadh. Riyad, I think you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, um, I'm trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Good, thank you. And can you see my screen? Very good. Thank you very much for inviting us. And uh, I'd like to congratulate James for his excellent initiatives. Um, um, and let me talk a little bit about what we are doing as UNDP uh, with the small island developing states uh, regarding the uh, SDGs. And one of the first questions that you ask, uh, Francesco, is are we all involved in the SDGs? Of course, this is the essence of our existence. This is the main objective of our work, and this is what we do day to day. <laughs> So, uh, and sometimes others do not realize that they are, they are working for the SDGs. So uh, perhaps they do not mention SDGs, but they're really doing the work regarding the SDGs. Uh, I want to put uh, a background on what I'm gonna say. Just a few days ago, we had uh, the UN General Assembly where all the small island developing states, uh, leader and communities stood together as they proved their strength and uh, commitment to reaching the 2030 agenda and tackling the existential threat of climate change. And uh, island communities in SIDS feel the urgency of this threat intimately, and they see their uh, seas rise, uh, their coral reef bleached, uh, and their town destroyed by natural disaster, most recently the Hurricane Dorian uh, in the Bahamas. So uh, seeds are defined as a special case for sustainable development uh, under the Rio framework due to the constraint that they face as uh, a result of their unique geographies. As you may know, 30% of the seeds populations uh, live at uh, less than five meters above the sea level. Um, the, I was, you know, really impressed by what uh, said the Prime Minister of Bahamas uh, during uh, the summit on the SDG, the summit on the Sustainable Development Goals, where she said if it was up to the seats, they would have dealt with climate change 30 years ago. Uh, 
And the small island developing state communities know their island, their ocean, their nature that sustain them. UNDP, through its role as an integrator, is in the position to support island communities to use this knowledge and will do will to embolden communities to imagine innovative local solutions to achieve the goals and target of the sustainable development goals. So the SDG, uh, you, you, you understand that need to be implemented at the national level, need to be landed at the local level, need to be landed at a community level if you want to have a real success. Uh, that is one of the things. Regarding the uh, specificity of uh, the island, you may know that uh, in 2014, we had uh, the third uh, small island uh, developing state conference where we discussed uh, the uh, Samoa pathway uh, at that time, which was adopted uh, by all the island. And uh, we, our role as UNDP is supporting the government of each island and the communities to link the sustainable development goals to the objective of the Samoa pathway. So how UNDP is leveraging its position to empower local communities to effectively tackle wider development challenges to local solutions to the SDGs by uh, putting community at the center of our work, by giving space to communities to elevate their solution and voices and determine their own destinies. If you remember very well the main differences between the MDGs and the SDGs, the SDGs came through a global, a worldwide consultation at the national level, at the local level, and that's how we were able to identify the main uh, objectives. So, uh, what did we do in uh, UNDP? Uh, just recently, we, implement, we established a UNDP Accelerator Lab, 60 in total worldwide, and four for the moment in small island developing states. I just want to give two examples. There's one in the Pacific, uh, at Fiji, and one in the Caribbean. So it was launched in, uh, in August, just re recently. And the Pacific Lab has adopted a grassroots approach, uh, emphasizing the importance of exploring socially acceptable and locally sourced solutions that will make addressing 21 uh, 21st century development challenges more effective and efficient. And in the Caribbean, UNDP launched this accelerator lab that will focus uh, on promoting locally based out uh, of the box solutions for the blue economy. So see, as you may know, since uh, on approximately 20% of the world uh, EEZ and the potential to expand their blue economies present and tapped opportunity to promote financially and socially inclusive development. So we're working with the um, villagers, we're working with fishermen, we're working with ecotourism communities in order for them to find uh, solutions. Uh, just recently also, uh, during, the year, during the General Assembly uh, this year, um, the Equator Prize and UNDP recognized uh, several communities for uh, their uh, innovations uh, regarding the implementation of the SDGs. So this year, communities from Vanuatu, Micronesia, and Guinea-Bissau were recognized by UNDP for their innovative nature-based solution to climate change at UNDP's Equator Prize. A sustainable community initiative take root through the tropic. They are laying the foundation for a global movement of local success that are collectively making a contribution to achieving the SDGs. As local and indigenous group across the tropic demonstrate and exemplify sustainable development, the Equator Prize shines a spotlight on their effort by celebrating them on uh, an international stage. And their prize is awarded based on several criteria, including impact, uh, meaning its relation to the SDGs, social inclusion, and scalability. So uh, in the case of Vanuatu, which was quite interesting, the world's most vulnerable nation to climate change, uh, the indigenous landowner business, Sertiak, has created the first accredited forest carbon project in the Pacific Island. And Sertiak protects, uh, protects and restores tropical rainforests, sequestering carbon while reducing vulnerability to flooding, drought, and uh, wind damage. And in an area where forest carbon uh, projects are uh, large scale, CERTIAC offers a powerful alternative based on indigenous land rights 
and a stewardship that has potential to be replicated across the Western Pacific Island. As part of the wider NACO program, this initiative has reduced approximately um, 15,000 tons of uh, CO2 emission from avoided deforestation and forest regeneration. So CERTAC is entirely self-sustaining and will generate income from carbon cells for 30 years with the option to extend through new generation. The initiative's uh, innovative financing illustrates a sustainable pathway to protect forests, uh, enhance local livelihood, and increase climate resilience across the Pacific. In the case of Micronesia, uh, the marine resources in Micronesia are threatened with uh, habitat destruction compounded by climate change and with severe effect on local communities. In response, the Tamil Council of Chief in the state of Yap established the Tamil Resource Conservation Trust to promote rich to rich conservation for community and ecosystem resilience. On land, watershed wide conservation project ensure the provision of clean water to over half of the population of Yap, while the first ever community nursery cultivate climate resilient native spices such as Nipa palm to reduce coastal erosion, uh, produces traditional food crops such as taro. Promoting use of the nursery to support agroforestry, the initiative decreases reliance on vulnerable coastal fishery for 848 families. At sea, the, the uh, Tamil Resource Conservation Trust has established a systematic marine conservation plan in collaboration with international partners and is a leader in the Pacific, illustrating how interwoven traditional knowledge and science can foster climate change mitigation and adaptation for future generations. As you see, there are many solutions which are uh, happening at uh, a local level. I can give the examples of Guinea-Bissau uh, also, but let me move to uh, the case of uh, the Tuvalu Ridge to, uh, to Reef projects. So in, tu in Tuvalu, the Ridge to Reef uh, initiative as part of a larger initiative. The project focus on enhancing and strengthening conservation and protected area by rehabilitating uh, degraded coastal and inland forests and landscape and supporting the delivery of integrated water resource management and uh, integrated coastal management at the national scales was piloting hands-on approach at the island scale, uh, enhancing governance and institutional capacity at the national, island, and community level for enhanced inland and coastal natural resource management, and finally, and improving data and information system that would enable uh, improved evidence-based planning, decision-making, and management of natural resources in two values. So for us, the we work had, I'm at the local story. level. Sorry, I know you're getting to a close, but there are yeah, so many people that want much. to join in as well. Thanks. Yes, this is the, the last thing for us. The, the key element for implementing the Sustainable Development Goals are United Nations. We go to the countries, we support developing SDG roadmap, but to be able to make sure it's going to be a success, we land it at the local level, making sure that the decision are taken at the local level. So the the um, institutional framework that you have at the national level does exist also at the local level and at the community level. Thank you very much. Riyad, thank you very, very much. Sorry for interrupting. But we now have roughly half an hour to have an interesting discussion with the audience, but also uh, towards the end to give Chiara the opportunity to give us a little bit more information about the UN hub that she mentioned. And I will ask James, while I open up this Q&A, to kindly um, share with the audience two further polls. And these polls are there for a reason, is because this session is really about public participation, it's about bottom-up policies. And what I'm asking you here is whether you have ever been on the receiving end of a public consultation process with an island community. It's, have you participated in a consultation process? Were you in the room and were you asked about something? This is not just about the sustainable development goals. So what I'd like to ask you is whether you have 
participated as part of a consultation process, not whether you have delivered one. I'm going to ask you that in just a second. Now, while we wait for the results, maybe even in the chat, uh, there are some key aspects that I would like people to focus on, which have come up. Okay, so we have here 56% have been part of a consultation process, but a good amount of people have not been involved. So that is interesting. The second poll that I asked James to kindly ask is a bit the opposite. So have you contributed to in whatever role have you ever been involved in preparing and or delivering a public consultation process with an island community? Again, this is not just about the sustainable development goals. It's about any sort of public consultation. And it's just for the, for the speakers as well to get a sense of how much public participation experience, let's say, practice people in the audience have. And I think there are a few questions while we see the poll is, and I take it from also my own personal experience in Scotland is precisely who is the island community? Who is it that is going to respond to the consultation? And then uh, very much how, how do the results of this public participation inform policy? in particular SDG related policy. And extremely important, once that policy is starting to be implemented, does the island community just disappear? Or, as one would hope, is it still there to promote accountability to the public decision maker? And if so, how? So think about these things while we start the Q&A with our fantastic speakers. Now, I have looked at the Q&A uh, feature and I have four questions, one for each speaker remaining. I saw that Tajana has answered a few, so that was great. So I would start with Chiara and I'm looking at the question that uh, our colleague Berit has uh, shared with us. And I think it's a really interesting and he asks, how did you share the information about the dashboard with the citizen? Do you have some statistics about who is actively using it? And I, I, I'd like to ask that questions on Betty's behalf because I think that is very important. It's very important to set up something that from the outside looks like a good practice, but if nobody uses it, if nobody knows about it, then it's not really useful. So I hope Chiara can just say a few words about what happens with the dashboard? What happens with the information? Do people know about it in Hawaii? If I go to Oahu or Molokai or wherever in Maui. Yes, yeah, so thank you for the question. And I think, so one of the goals for Hawaii Green Growth is definitely to increase community awareness of what is going on on the dashboard because it is designed for, as I said, decision makers and for citizens and, and everybody in Hawaii or anybody that would like to access the dashboard. Um, but there still is um, an ongoing effort to sort of make the community more aware of the dashboard and what it's tracking. And one of the ways that we do that is how I sort of mentioned earlier, our community driven data pilot. So actively partnering with existing um, sustainability initiatives and projects that are going on, whether they're at schools or with existing um, nonprofit organizations and working directly with them um, to upload their data onto the dashboard and sort of create these connections. So it's a, it's a slow ongoing process, but um, yeah, so it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Yeah. Uh, I now move to Petra. Uh, if you see in the Q and A, uh, there is a very interesting question from our colleague Daniel um, down there, yes. And he asks, do you believe it has been more effective to create an island island specific translation of UN SDGs and how are these efforts measured? And before you answer, I, I like this question because in the effort that Nicola and I, obviously in collaboration with other partners, have done in Scotland, one of the key questions, and remember there are over 90 inhabited islands in Scotland, is that every, Sco every Scottish island is different. 
even if they're extremely close. I can think of Jura and the island of Isla. They're very different. So how can you actually have a definition of sustainable development or an approach of the SDGs that is a blanket approach to everybody? And I wonder whether Petra can expand on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very central. I think we, we did create our own version. The, by, at that time, uh, when we started, the uh, SDGs had just re recently been adopted and were not that well known. But also, I think the UN can sometimes feel a little bit far away from the, from the local person, maybe thinking that this is this international far away for developing nations or whatever, and, and it doesn't concern us. But by doing a translation, I think we, we, we get closer to the people. And I mean, the people, I would say I myself am part of the people, and I think it makes sense to, to make our own. And should I also answer how we measure them? Yeah. Okay. So, so we have these status reports. We have now three made three status reports, and we measure progress on each goals. And as you know, as you do, we we make indicators. It's not so easy because there's a lot of discussion on on which indicators to choose and so on. But just traditional indicators delivered in status report on a meeting, an annual Badcraft network meeting to which everyone is invited. And we use the, the statistics we have and, and try to be innovative in, in that sense, but also traditional. So yes, we measure. So thank you very much, Petra, and uh, clearly measuring the the, the very dangerous and keyword effectiveness, what does effectiveness mean, is, is absolutely crucial, but one needs to make an effort to measure. Ma, the third question is, is for Nicola, and I see that Nicola has already answered it in the Q&A, but I think it would be useful for everybody, and I'm happy to join in also, Nicola, is a question um, about whether the, in a way, the methodology that the team has chosen to consult island communities in Scotland could also be undertaken virtually. And I saw your response, but I'd like you to share it with everybody else. Yep, hi there. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it, Betty, it was a really interesting point. Um, it was whether the consultation could be undertaken virtually. Um, and I'm saying at the moment, I just don't think that's viable for Scottish islands um, for two main reasons. One of the main things that came up in the consultation is um, how poor digital connectivity is um, in many of the Scottish islands. It's not uniform at all. Um, so even getting people access uh, would be very difficult and it would exclude people right off the bat. Um, secondly, at the moment, a high proportion of the island's population is older. Um, and they made it very clear to us when we when we visited the islands that um, they appreciated the fact that we'd come face to face and that's how they prefer to consult. There was also um, somebody mentioned in the chat asking about the population of Scottish islands because the pictures seem to show that it was particularly older people that had participated in the consultation. And that, that is correct, we did find that. And we also made the effort though to go to schools and engage with young people um, in different areas. But the, the, the reality was it was quite a lot of older people rather than the younger generation that participated in these events, which is something that we need to look at going forward to definitely get the voice of the younger community um, involved as well. Thank you, Nicola. The only thing I will add, and I'm expanding a little bit, and I know James is uh, listening to us virtually, because I also think this is a bigger debate on what a virtual event can actually achieve. And I think a virtual island summit like this is in a way slightly different from a virtual consultation process with an island community. And I'm not excluding it. If, there are the, if, if the given circumstances are there, and clearly the technology is there, then a virtual consultation may well work to some extent, even with the methodology we used. But what we experienced by actually going to the Scottish Islands was almost the richness, the flavor, the, the connection with the people. And one of the things that has to happen is for this connection to continue. I am not sure that connection can happen for that specific goal virtually. 
clearly is different if we're doing a summit like this and an event to share practices that I commend James. And I think this is the way forward, uh, at least at the large scale. So I just wanted to add my piece there. So I now have a question for Riyadh. Uh, again, this you can have a look at it in the Q&A. And um, it's from Hoke. And Hoke says at 4.26 p.m., Riyadh, which of these initiatives were the quickest and easiest to implement? And I think, although it's a very tricky question, it, it is an important one because sometimes resources are limited. Sometimes one has to, although you may want to do everything, you want something to happen and to measure it and, and to show progress. So I wonder whether you can even react to that question or whether the question in itself should be framed in a different way. It's a very complicated question. Quickest, I, I, we usually do not compare the uh, experience from the community to the community because it depends on the context, the environment where you are working. It's completely different if you're working in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, or in the African uh, uh, island states. So for us, it's a, a different environment. When I was giving the examples of uh, Tuvalu, and I have an examples of Guinea-Bissau, which is a small island developing states too, is, is the approaches are completely uh, different. What we evaluate is the result of the work that the community uh, has initiated. And this is for us is how they were able to innovate and how the, the, we can um, replicate at the national level. You know, most of the time, you know, the, the government reach out to us for uh, solutions. And we reach out to the communities for the solutions. You see, we make sure that we sometimes we connect the communities to the national authorities. This is the key element. On the SDGs in the small and developing states, I can tell you many times when I go and I try to help the national authorities, private sector, civil society, and developing partner to prepare a roadmap, a national roadmap for, for the countries. You know, the, no, the, the one who knows mostly the importance of the SDGs day to day is at the community level. And so that's why for, for us is we try to push to support any initiatives at the community level, at the local level to innovate, to innovate for finding solutions on the SDGs because this is what they are living day to day. This is not something exceptional. This is not something that they do when they have time. This is what they do every day every day so for us is it quicker it depends is the result that we evaluate not the fast the fact that it's going faster than any other one thank you very much Riyad. Uh, i'd like to now give the floor to chiara again with another hat let's say with the un uh, 2030 island local hub hat but before i let chiara just share some more information to us I also want to highlight that throughout some of the sessions I was lucky to attend over the past three days, the SDGs were mentioned. And it's precisely what Riyadh was saying. I mean, if you frame it in a specific way, everything is SDG. The SDGs are life. The SDGs are the way we, we operate. But clearly, everybody then operates in different ways. So you need to adapt them, you need to nuance them. But what they have, and these are words that were told by other moderators and speakers throughout the three days, is that the SDGs become almost a tool. They become a tool, they become a tool to, ba to create baselines, they become methodologies, and they become a partner almost in what we are doing from a legal and policy perspective on islands. And I think this idea of partnership is a good way to now give the floor to Chiara because, and she will say more clearly, I do think that what Hawaii Green Growth and GLISP are leading is very much something that can bring islands together. So Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. I'm just going to, I know I said I wasn't going to, but I'm gonna quickly, share my screen just so that I can have my principles up there and okay so 
I, as I mentioned um, during my presentation uh, about two weeks ago at the UN General Assembly, the Local 2030 Islands Network was launched. And this network brings together diverse partners committed to accelerating island-led solutions to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals and to more generally promote an island worldview. The Local 2030 Islands Network aims to accelerate implementation of SDGs, connecting islands and local communities with um, a global effort. The network will engage island partners at all levels, local, regional, and national, that are committed to advancing locally driven best practices for sustainability, public-private partnerships, measuring progress um, that lead to concrete actions. The Local 2030 Islands Network will help support island-led SDG implementation to advance Local 2030 and the Samoa pathway. The Local 2030 Network will be launched, or it has been launched, um, two weeks ago. And I, I briefly mentioned earlier the UN, um, the founding partners, um, which include the Republic of Seychelles, Republic of Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, Grenada, Belize, Curacao, Ireland, Hawaii, Guam, um, the UN Development Program, UN Habitat, and the Global Island Partnership, Hawaii Green Growth, and the UN Foundation. And so together, the network will share best practices and scale successful models to significantly amplify impact as one of the local implementation strategies of the Samoa Declaration. And the network partners will meet later this year uh, or early 2020 and during the high level political forum in July 2020. Um, the local 2030 island network partners are committed to promoting best practices um, in sustainable development that fit with the local and cultural circumstances of each island and to implement strategies that achieve the SDGs locally with an island worldview. Um, to join the network, partners have to commit to the following key principles which are up on the screen or identify resources to support island action and promote global impact. So principle one would be identifying local goals to advance the UN sustainable development goals and strengthen long-term political leadership on sustainable development and climate resilience. Principle two, measure SDG progress through tracking and reporting on locally and culturally informed indicators. Principle three, strengthen public-private partnerships that support diverse stakeholders in integrating sustainability priorities into policy and planning. And principle four, implementing concrete initiatives that would build island resilience through locally appropriate solutions, particularly at the water energy food nexus. And I would like to invite you to join our effort to spread an island worldview across the world to achieve our global goals. On the screen now is an email address that you can um, email to get more information. The network is still quite young. Um, so we're still sort of forming the path forward, um, but I would ha be happy to answer your questions or somebody um, in the network would be happy to answer your questions. So please send them to that email. And yes, thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much, Chiara. So uh, I have asked, and they're coming, so I've asked for people to post on the Q&A if you have any specific question on the network. And I see here one which I'll ask immediately. So the question, Chiara, comes again from Berit, and it is, would this network want to cooperate and engage with bigger islands as well and whether a webinar series could be developed to share the experiences can you answer that Kara? so i guess i would first want to know what is meant by bigger islands <laughs> um but uh, yes i guess if an, an island is an island and we really truly are all living on island earth as we like to call it um but yes i to the general sorry was there it was a two-part question no I mean, I can look at it myself. If you look at the QA. Ah, webinar series to share experiences. Well, James might have to answer that question. Aha. Uh -huh. so, Bet it is saying New Zealand. So, um, which is a series of islands. <laughs> yeah. And um, so we, yeah, of course. I mean, I think any island community is very, we share this very common understanding of the, I mean, we have various 
differing problems that we all kind of have these same sort of island problems or, or challenges that, and opportunities that connect us all. And so we all have lots to learn and benefit from by connecting with one another. Um, so yes, New Zealand. I love New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I think uh, as interesting as that question is, it, it almost takes you back to one of the sessions with Professor Baldacchino and Island Studies and what is an island and so forth. And uh, I don't think we have the time because we're really closing here to enter into that discussion. But I do think I just want to highlight that the network has been launched at the United Nations General Assembly uh, just a few days ago, to be honest. And this is a reality. It's very much linked to Samoa pathway. And uh, it also highlights how sustainable development goals are linked clearly also to other international legal and political processes. And the first one that comes to mind clearly is uh, not the only one, but clearly is the climate change process. So while we are here talking about the SDGs and SDG 7 clearly is related to climate change, 13 is about climate change, it will be interesting to see how this local 2030 network engages with the UN climate process. And uh, as people will know, COP26 will actually take place in the city where the University of Strathclyde is hosted, Glasgow. And the university will be delighted to collaborate with Hawaii Green Growth and with GLISPA and with the network to see whether we can convene something that is meaningful, not just for the sake of convening something, but something that is actually meaningful from a climate perspective, from an SDG perspective, and from an island policy perspective. And I'm just kindly asking uh, James, if he is uh, around on the chat, to tell me exactly how many more minutes we have, because we may have different uh, watches. Uh, according to my watch, we would still have five minutes. But if uh, James can tell me what he thinks. Uh, yeah, I get that. So I'm assuming we still have a few minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. So we still have uh, some time for maybe any of the speakers, if they want to add something, maybe just briefly, uh, and then I will wrap up uh, the whole session. So is there any of the speakers? I can see you, except Nicola, I can see you. So if you just give me a wave, and uh, if somebody from you, either from the Q&A or any other point you would like to make, I'm happy to give you the floor. Okay, I see Kiana. I'll give you the floor, Kiana. I have a more of a sort of housekeeping question. When the session is over, is the ability to answer the question, the Q and A questions, finished? Because <laughs> there are a few that I haven't had the opportunity to address. No worries. So. Uh... There is the opportunity to go on the Facebook page of the Virtual Island Summit, and uh, usually the conversation moves from here to there, let's say. Uh, if you have registered to the Virtual Island Summit, there's also an app, an Attendify app, where you can add yourself and have a really interesting conversation with those who are on the app. So there are plenty of ways to keep the to keep the momentum going. I see James has just put the link to the Facebook where all the videos, all the sessions have been recorded live and you can then see them again. So Chiara, I give you the role of uh, telling your colleagues and friends in Hawaii to go there because I know it's extremely early in Hawaii. So they can then later during the day see what uh, the session was all about, okay? Okay, thank you. And then just to quickly wrap up, I just want to say thank you to my fellow panelists, to you, Francesco, to James, and everybody that was on the organizing side, and of course to the participants. Um, as people from, from island communities, we have a lot that we need to work on in a really quick window, um, but as island people, we are resilient, um, we are resourceful, and I know that we have it in us, we just have to work together. So this is a, has been a really inspiring experience for me. Um, and I hope to keep in touch with, well, anybody who wants to keep in touch. So thank you. Wants to say something, but, but first Riyadh. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Thank you, first of all, for the excellent moderation. Uh, but I have a question for you and for James. 
this is uh, the first virtual uh, uh, summit or conference. Um, and my main question is, after all those discussions, exchange of ideas, uh, tools, what's going to happen? How is going to impact uh, the day-to-day -day work for the seats? Uh, how is going to impact or perhaps support the acceleration uh, of the implementation of the sustainable development goals? That's something very important for us. Uh, what's going to be the result? How do you see that? Uh, beyond the fact that it's recorded and we can always have access to that, but beyond that, this innovation of having a virtual conference, what do we do after that? So I hope James doesn't mind. I will leave it to James, <laughs> but maybe James can think about it. And at the end of the summit, uh, I'm sure there's a wrapping session, something like that. He can maybe not just answer to you, Riyad, but an answer to everybody. I will highlight, and I will give the floor to Petra immediately, that that aside, which is extremely important, I think what this does is allows people, especially on rural islands, to get together. And I cannot think of any other way in which people based on some of the islands I had the pleasure and the luck to visit in Scotland over the past months could be in touch with people from Molokai in Hawaii, from the Grenadines in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, from Tierra del Fuego. So even if it's just that, this is massive. But I completely agree with you, Riyad. We have to work together and sure James is already thinking about it. Okay, this is working. Let's make it work even better and have a policy drive and make an impact with it. So I, I'm with you with that, Riyad. Petra, you want to say just a goodbye or something? Well, I can say thank you from my, my side. I'm from the Holland Islands and it's been very inspirational. And I think inspiration is already setting something in, into movement. So thank you. And I will finish now just by uh, highlighting that if we do want island communities to thrive, and I will say this, it's not just about island communities, just local communities to thrive. Consultation has to be taken seriously. It has to be taken seriously from those who deliver the consultation and from those who are at the consultation. And if not public participation is just a meaningless word, uh, even for those who are like me, lawyers, it's just a principle on a piece of paper that doesn't mean anything. I do think that the examples in Island Islands, in Hawaii, and ho hopefully what we have done in Scotland and what Croatia is doing can be shared. I'm not saying they're good practices, but they are practices. I like to think they're good practices, but the sharing aspect of them is crucial. And I think in that way, islands within the framework of the SDGs, nuanced to their own reality, can actually move forward. So I leave it to that. I would like to thank absolutely everybody that have been. I saw up to 94 participants at some point, so that's really great. And I again would like to say a great well done to James and all the people around them and the partners at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States to make this happen. And I look forward to many future sessions. Bye-bye.